Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the City Convention Centre on the 12th floor at City Flinders campus. And of course, welcome to Rotunda in the West Conversations with Australian writers. And what a galaxy of writers we have tonight. Never been done before. Seven great writers all in the one room at the one time. Tonight's event is entitled My Enduring Love Affair with Writing. G'day. I, uh, <clears throat> I can write to Raymond saying I'm not a writer because uh, I'm not. <laughs> I'm, actually, uh, <clears throat> I'm actually in banking and advertising. <laughs> well, I clean a bank and deliver junk mail. So I guess, yeah, if I was a car salesman, I'd say that I was in banking and finance. Uh, I told you I'd try stand-up. <laughs> How do I go? Yeah. All right. In the beginning, there were sleepless nights. In the beginning, there was worry, self-doubt, and racing thoughts which made sleep impossible. I read a self-help book back then, which reckoned if you couldn't sleep, you should get out of bed, write down whatever was troubling you, and just get it all out. So that's what I did. I'd sit there in the middle of the night, writing down my racing thoughts. Writing for me was an artistic pursuit. It was medicine. The thought of anyone ever seeing those endless sentences of my inner life would have the fruit of the purpose. But much to my surprise, this method of a writing sleeping pill worked. I'd leave all the bad stuff on the page of a Spyrax notebook and finally drift off to sleep. One night, when I got all my worries out, I wrote a poem. I didn't know how or why, it just kind of came out. I hadn't tried to write anything since back in the dark ages at the prestigious Collingwood Technical School, <laughs> which wasn't particularly prestigious. <laughs> back then, for me, writing was a nightmare. My shaky hands and fountain pens were natural enemies, and getting anything onto a page was a struggle. I didn't want to be a writer. Truth is, I couldn't think of anything worse. But here I was in the wee small hours, in my dressing gown and slippers, writing a poem. For a long time, I kept my strange nocturnal habits a secret. When I finished writing something, I'd tear it up and whack it in the bin, convinced that anyone ever saw it, it would confirm the fact that I was quite mad and in need of immediate psychiatric attention. My first writing class was at Tate in St Albans. And I guess in today's economic climate, it would probably be considered not worth funding. It didn't lead to a new career. I didn't pay a king's ransom in fees. But I reckon it would be impossible to put what those classes did for me on a pie chart. At the age of 44, I realised that writing was a legitimate activity that classrooms can create community and that the toing and froing of stories is a gift. So it is so, Bruno, I didn't learn much about style or form or plot. <laughs> but I learned a lot about honesty and sharing and saving the things of every day and taking risks. My love affair with writing, like most love affairs, has run hot and cold. I wish I had the discipline of a Helen Garner or a Bryce Courtney 
He brought himself to the desk for an eight hour stint and just write. But that's not my way. Writing isn't my job. Writing is a friend I turn to when I need to find out who I am today. Writing lets me say on the page things that my nervous voice won't allow me to say aloud. I often leave a social situation and an hour later think of what I should have said. I get to know my opinion, what my opinions and passions are, not in the heat of a conversation, but by sitting down at the kitchen table, scrubbing words onto a page. Writing gives me the chance to wander back to the streets where I grew up, the chance to hear and smell and feel things which would otherwise be beyond my reach. Writing lets me celebrate my past and cheer my heroes. My heroes didn't make the papers, didn't make a fortune, but by living their ordinary lives, made my life extraordinary. To, to those of you here that write, keep going. To those of you who want to write, throw yourself into it. Pick up a pen and write about your world. Tell us what moves you, what excites you, and even what pisses you off. Write about politicians that only want votes, millionaires that only want more, and refugees that are treated like invaders. Over the past six months, I've had the opportunity to run some writing workshops. And it wasn't a case of who called the teacher a bastard. The real question was, who called the bastard a teacher? <laughs> During those sessions, I got to share my love of writing and hopefully encourage the group to scratch out a few lines of their own. I shared how, for me, Writing has become a way of coping with mental illness in the hope that it may help others. At the end of the last workshop, they presented me with a pen as a parting gift. But the real gift they gave me was the confirmation that writing and living and finding your voice is important. Last year, I had a collection of my stories published and that was a heady experience. I've got a little book that marks 20 odd years of chasing daydreams. To be published is a privilege, but to quote Paul Bateman in the recent edition of Platform, to be published is a bonus. To be published is the last and least in the chain of true creation. Thank you. Bruno Littieri, don't you love saying that name? Bruno Littieri, is that right? Did I pronounce that right? It's close, Littieri. Yeah. He's an inspiration to me, and I think he's probably an inspiration to a lot of people here. Is that true? Yeah. Give him a round of applause. He's such an inspiration that when he said, uh, he talked about the theme for tonight, which was my enduring love affair with writing, I um, took it as inspiration rather than an opportunity to talk to you about how and why I write. I could chat about that over a beer or two if you want. But um, what I did was I, I sort of looked at this question, this idea of the um, enduring love affair with writing. I thought, I'm in a really rocky position at the moment with my relationship with writing. I didn't even want to talk about it to anybody. I was just talking to Hanny about the experience of, um, I guess it's loving in the dark rather than labouring in the dark, but you can sort of work and work and work and work and wonder what the hell you're doing. But I took Bruno's inspiration and thought, I'll go back to my first love, I'll go back to poetry, and I'll allow his statement to inspire me for a few weeks until tonight. And uh, four poems have come out. Hooray. 
<laughs> Lucky they did. And I, when I look at them, I look and think, well, they've, they've dealt with different kinds of love too. Love for friends, love for, I guess, the world around you. Um, the third one is trying to understand yourself. And the fourth one's trying to understand your family. All of these things connected to love and the experience of writing that offers you that connection with these subjects. So I'll start with the first one. I wrote it uh, in inspiration. Um, I found out about a friend of mine, Kevin Hart, who's a poet, a really great poet, who's um, recently separated from his wife. And I found that it's a really heavy experience to hear that. And I'd, I've been through the same thing. And uh, as my, my response just came out in poetry rather than in words to him. And it's called The End of the Butterfly Years. Your wife of the butterfly years returns to her cocoon, and the scrape of a workman's shovel plays heavy metal from which even your son shields his ears. Your wit has deserted you too. You can't bring yourself to clash a dry pun on a sweet symbol. No words will describe the words you're forced to rock in your arms. You slip on the wet floorboards of your own poems, but won't allow yourself a towel or the luxury of a fire to dry damp similes. The garden where meaning, truth and beauty stood, traditionally robed and dignified, now show footprints filled drip by drop with salt water you refuse to name. Here's the memory of your wife the butterfly years in your bed, peeling fig after fig, making you think engulfed by sadness, but you mean sadness gulfs you, scatters the land you were to form a drowning archipelago. But all these metaphors sicken you, Neither images nor their deconstruction will do to explain the clown who cried himself from the circus, who reads a short letter from a long piece of paper, while lawyers tie fly-blown wigs in knots. How did the bathroom cupboard get so empty or the children's eyes forget their colour? That rug must be removed with everything under it, even the broom, and you won't get yourself started on the bedroom cupboard, the coat hangers chiming their advice, you're free if only to walk in a coma while friends shake you with promises, unlimited travel expense accounts, more figs to slice than Adam on his wedding night, and long hours of television you hoped one day to find time for. But now it's ticking, you see your reflection in a dark screen watching you, if only it were, not this modified version, hacked from the mountain by workmen then pushed back into the cutting, no evidence to show what their shovels removed. And your wife of the butterfly years is in her cocoon, but no, wait, she's flying again, spinning circles round the sun. The heat from her flutter warms your skin, but turns your dreams to moth wing dust. You stand in the midst of the cloud, flap your arms and from your sleeves four words, the larvae you wrote for her, stillborn to the floor. That's one of the things that poetry offers you, that ability to tap into emotions at a, a level when you just can't understand them. They can come out a different way. I've been doing these things called, that I'm calling field recordings, where I turn up in places and I, I text away on my phone, but really I'm not texting, I'm taking notes on what people are saying, and I apply rules to this. This is actually a formal type of poetry, and there are rules, I'm not going to explain them, it'd be boring, but I'll just read the poem. And it's called Field Recordings, Emerald Hotel, South Melbourne. <laughs> he's turning 57 in a month, and the last six months, I don't know, he's, you don't compromise yourself, no, no, they're there, but so many close family friends, people like Steve and Jane, they're the types, you know, it's ridiculous. Everyone's on edge, so you've got to sort it out. My son-in-law, last Saturday night, I put the caravan at the front door. I put it at the front door, and I was rooted. It weighs a ton, but not quite. The guys from Repat came, but they can't do it until next Tuesday. Your birthday present. It's your factory. You're the one with the title. When I went to the footy Anzac Day, the MCG's drainage, the big difference is you don't see mud on the ground. I'd just like to learn about it. Guns and knives and the General of Rome. His general knowledge just leaves me speechless. He should be running the other way, not looking at the sun. He hasn't got a mean bone in his body. Wait until you see my new shoes. <laughs> Thanks. And this one hasn't even got a title. It's so new. You awake to find it's too late to make the journey. 
The bathroom is too far from the mountains, which are too far from another identity crisis. You consider an initial between your names, a new pair of hiking boots, and an electric toothbrush. But the sale catalogue, you notice, was written by Patterson, not Lawson, and the prices are beyond you, on horseback, shouting, not drunk on the back of a splintered wagon. Wait for the weather to clear, shouts the motivational speaker, folding his wings and smiling from his cocoon. But you've never seen so much fog in your bathroom. Your reflection in the misted mirror, in great coat and beanie, could be Albert T. Washington. Now there's an identity, a mountain to climb, a mouth of myth to throw your false teeth into. <laughs> if I had to analyse that poem, which I wouldn't sort of dare put upon my students, I think it's about the writing process <laughs> and dealing with love in the dark. I call something love in the dark. Probably has been called that. This one's about, um, well, everyone who's had a mother. Everyone had a mother, hopefully. Um, and the tone that some mothers can take. This is my last one. Thanks for having me. And uh, thanks, Bruno, again for the chance to read. It's called A Motherly Tone. And it's a bit of a performance poem. I'll end up in the loony bin. You kids will send me to Ararat, you know, one day with your bickering and fighting and carrying on. Can't you behave yourselves? Stop the Tommy Rot for a minute. Look at my hands. They're on fire and I don't see one of you little buggers trying to put them out. Don't try now. Stop. Let go of them. You'll burn yours too. Then you'll have nothing to cuddle me with if it's dark in your room and I'm crying. Go on then, off you go, ignore your mother, like you always do. I'll just climb in the fridge, clear out the beer, sit in there and knit cold pearls to wear out for dinner. Where's your father? Don't you kids turn out like him, gonna be here, gonna do this, he's hopeless, that man fiddling and faddling around. Don't you play up for the babysitter, or oh, by golly, you'll get one right across your backsides. I tell you what now, there'll be no mucking around. Stop that sniggering or it's back in your egg carton. There'll be no going to surfers this summer. I'll poach you buggers with butter, stamp you under high heels till yolks rise up in your throats. That's right, off you go. Ignore your mother. Go on with you, the lot of you. I'll be a bloody rat by summer. Where's your father? Let me out of this fridge. My mouth's freezing over. <laughs>
It wants to draw a little blood. We're not always like this. Yesterday, writing was all tenderness and tissues. Social media invited me down a knobbly garden path on the promise of kind words about my book. But I didn't heed the words of the wise Luddites. Don't go there. And so I met an amateur critic, one with an agenda. She writes just what you'd expect from a neighbour's actor. The spray can spewed onto the toilet wall of the internet. I gasped and I read on, compelled to read all the personal cuts that chopped me up as though I was a beast in one of those televised abattoirs. Then it was writing that picked me up off the floor and put me back together as I attempted to make sense of the words. I don't expect everyone to like everything I write, I whined, but can't they at least be civil? Maybe I shouldn't mention my past, maybe I should cover my tracks. Writing cooed then, reminding me there's a reason I own up to the fullness of myself, to neighbours and pate wrapping and loss and stupidity. Reminding me that if I hide anything of myself, I deny the glorious, messy muddle that is life, and I deny access to writing. Keep on doing it. Make yourself a big target, writing said. You're not special. You're not different. You're messy, like everyone. And besides, this messy self with bits of tissue sticking to her chest is all you've got. Now stop snivelling and get on with it. And so I brushed off the tattered flecks of Kleenex from my black jumper and my hands went back to the computer's keys and writing curled up on the red chair in the corner and we spent yesterday afternoon in companionable silence. And as a reward, late in the day, we walked together. If writing will walk beside me, the world falls into place. When we're in sync, the sky lifts high, the breeze of good karma wafts about, and the engine room that is my heart pumps evenly. Writing is walking, and walking is writing on those days. Rhythm, rhyme, stepping in time, words tumbling about me like leaves in autumn, stories dancing ahead like off-leash pups. Then, writing calls me out to the horizon of myself, calls me to listen to the syntax of the streets, calls me to continue the Camino of words, calls me finally back to the desk where my seated self still holds the beat, beat, beat of my composing feet. And if I'm lucky, writing will dissolve into me, merge, and we will be those lovers you read about in the books I can't write, those lovers who complete each other. Of course, I don't want to write those books, and I don't want to be completed by writing. I want to be complete in order to meet it. I want to stand up and look writing in the eye and invite it to share my days in the clean, clear light of mutual knowledge. I want to be able to say to writing, and to the world through my writing, that the totality of me is like the totality of all of us, complicated, tender, unknowable, unconfined, tough, small, true, and steadfast. I want to tell writing that I'm listening to it and to the world and to my full self. Mostly, I want to reassure writing that I won't pick it up and put it down again as I have in the past, because I have been careless with writing. I have been unfaithful and taken it for granted. I have left it for long periods. No wonder it needs to spit at me sometimes, to draw blood, to pierce my surfaces. It's reminding me of how it felt when I abandoned it, wandering off to have liaisons with stages and TV sets and in rehearsal rooms. Liaisons that brought pleasure and that I can now feed to writing. But liaisons that left it back then hungry and mangy with neglect. Now it nips at my heels because it has not learned to trust that I will stay. 
It has seen me fall in love with actors and directors and other people's stories, and it's reminding me that it's I, not it, not writing. I, who am fickle. Writing has been there from the start. When writing coos and is kind, it is the same cooing I heard when, as an infant, I would listen to my mother read me to sleep, or later when I would scrawl my childish stories to the stars in Western Australia. When it hisses, I recognise the sound as the same one it made as I wandered off to play with less demanding companions, less rigorous friends, and left my notebooks languishing. When writing spits at me and won't play, it's waking me to the fact that either willingly or not, it has been the constant, and I have been the one who has strayed. And so now I come back for more. Not because I need battering or to feel pain, but because I understand that I have responsibilities here. Love turns up every day regardless. Love shows up. Love earns love. So I keep showing up, proving that I am true, that writing really is love and not an infatuation or a fantasy. Because finally, having wandered in other creative countries and with other playmates, I realise that it is writing that has sustained me. Writing has made sense of me to me. My writing, but the writing of others. Suburban stories and bush ballads, in foreign tongues and in varied forms, plays and poems and essays and yarns. Writing has shaped the world and my days. In the sharp light shed by writing, I can see more than my shadow self. Sometimes I can glimpse my best self. And so I sit here with writing snarling in the corner, determined to win back its full trust and to love it with all the clear-eyed, thin-skinned, tough-tempered, open-hearted, full-blown, mature love that I can bring to it. Because a love affair is more than the first flush, the proffered roses, the tentative smiles. A continuing, enduring love affair is about earning the right to stay by being constant and unflinching and true. So while writing growls, I'll be right here, waiting for the moment when it looks into my eyes and tells me, in a voice that is neither caressing or punishing, that I am worthy of it. Thanks. They're wonderful notes, they're very inspiring, and they're sort of a to me with your spirit, and get you fired up to keep writing and keep sharing stories. Well, I, I feel incredibly privileged to be here tonight because it's it's my only my second time at the Rotunda. Everyone else on the bill's done plenty of them because they're you know they're much more experienced at it. But uh, the the feeling I take is of incredible optimism and rigor that Bruno, with all his generosity and spirit, still manages to instill the feeling that writing's work, and that's a great thing to give people. And you know, a great teacher is is all that anyone needs in their life and everyone seems to have that here so I just feel lucky to have been part of an amazing night in the company of giants. <laughs>